archive. We we are a digital library, California <coughs> library. We our primary focus is originally was text. I guess um, we capture as much material as possible. I pointed back there because that's kind of our future library. Um, the the Rube Goldberg, mach Goldberg machine that's open back there and all the stuff going on is only gets maintenance like once every six months. You happen to be here the day it got it. Yeah. So um, it's, we can print a book from scratch. And JP, there's probably one over there. Isn't there an example of a book we've printed? One of those dark binded ones. I showed it to somebody. But uh, we, can, we just have a PDF file we print it. Book comes out of there. So um, we store about 100,000 books we can print out of there. But total, I think we have about four or 500,000 books digitized. 85 billion web pages. Why do you store? That's um, we stored at our data center, one downtown, one in Mountain View, and we're looking to expand. And this box, buildings. this funny red looking thing, is what around the corner you can't quite see it, but that's your uh, your that's book art. box. That's your peta box. Yeah. Petabyte. Can you do color books or just black and white books? We do color books. We do all of it. Um, How big is the internet right now? How much is it? It's big. <laughs> I don't know what's right. You don't answer that. that. You capture what's right. And I, yeah, they, I, I'm fine. sure they can figure out a general size, extrapolate out right? what we see is, is the actual size. But right now we're keeping three, about three and a half petabytes, right? No, three and a hundred petabytes mm -hmm. at the data center. At the data center right yeah. now. Mm -hmm. I think it's 300 petabytes. It's still growing rapidly, the internet? How much? Yes. Oh, yeah. No, I don't think we, we don't store that much. Oh. We, we store like three petabytes with the backup as well. The backup is petabytes. petabytes. Yeah, it's pretty big. We, we, we outgrew one data center because they couldn't handle the heat anymore. So now we have to. So now they're trying to come up with other ways to cool. But when you're trying to archive the internet, yeah. you know, that's <laughs> that every month. Well. It produces heat. Yeah, it produces yeah. heat. If you go. So, it's missing. That's, there's, we have a whole bunch of conspiracy theories about, that, about what's missing from the web. But, yeah, we scroll and just, we capture chunks of it. We don't actually get the entire web. But we get a representative sample every month. Every month. So you just every kind of month, rotate, basically. kind of travel around. It's a scroll, yeah, they scroll the, they scroll the web, the way back Some machine. basis? And, For deciding what you're going to record? Sure, yeah. Sometimes it's, sometimes it's decided by, like, we're going to all, all of this kind of stuff. Yeah. Other parts of it are automatic and random, just going through and taking chunks out. And of course, we've had some 9-11 conspiracy theorists think that the lack of data or the gaps is indica indicative of, of us being involved. <laughs> <laughs> how, how can you, how can you be you? Uh, we, it's tried me, it's me. we tried to explain no, it to them, but yeah, logic really doesn't work. So if you go on our Wikipedia entry for Internet Archive, yeah. so let's go to the controversy. <laughs> <laughs> so um, that's kind of where we are. I don't want to steal yeah, too much time, and we can talk about the specifics here of the vast Internet Archive. You have an Internet bestiary zoo yet? Uh, <laughs> and, and, not yet. And the other element, of course, is. is large dedicated archives of like the Prelinger yeah. film archive <laughs> and now the Ver Timothy Leary archive. Yeah. Post yeah. Yeah. Arts and the, the uh, um, yeah, some way. A lot of it you can get from the Alexa crawls of what what's going on, Alexa information, but there's also other statistics which when we show our website you'll see there's a vast mm -hmm. amount. Um, it, it's hard to get good solid information of what we're doing right at the moment because we're doing so much at the moment. One of the things we're doing is nasaimages.org, which is the project I'm working on, and yeah. it's collecting all the NASA images. It'll be the largest collection of NASA images, video, audio, everything. Cool. Yeah. Scientific data visualization. And, and today I brought a one terabyte hard drive up to, for it to be the virtual, it's the virtual worlds of the history of the virtual world medium. Just dump about three, two, three hundred pieces in. For that project with Stanford. So. Mm -hmm. and, and it's all private? This is all, this is all open. Um, no, no, but it's private. It's uh, funded or? We're a variety of fundings through grants. And, and it was Microsoft was a, was a big player until yeah. about three weeks ago. Yeah, three three weeks. Weeks and they pulled the plug on a huge percentage of our funding. So. Yeah, yeah. But that was just for the books, yeah. 
That was for the book scan. Yeah, it just, for, yeah, it just, yeah. It just officially is part of the book scan. Yeah, you don't have archives in Microsoft. Yeah, we won't go away. We won't go away anytime soon. Our, our founder and the foundations that exist around that have made sure that we have funding for that aspect. Thank you. I okay. know where you are. Total shift of gear. Um, uh, this is um, a little music expo exploration system that I came up with. And um, the idea is. Uh, how many of you have seen examples of evolutionary music tools, or played with them, or even made them? Okay. Like Max and a few like Whatever, any kind of software-based music system that grows and evolves and changes, right? You mean like using genetic programming? Or? Sure, yeah. There's lots of them. They're, they're, they're growing in number. In fact, I think uh, Brian Eno is, was one of the earlier proponents of this. Um, Apparently, most of these work by you take a snippet of music and you listen to it and you grade it. You give it a fitness mm -hmm. function and then you say, okay, that's good, and you listen to another. So it's kind of piecemeal. And I've always wanted to have a music that you listen to and it's always playing and you're always rewarding it or punishing it as mm -hmm. it's going. It never stops. Mm -hmm. So this music has no beginning, no middle, or end. Well, it actually has a beginning. And the middle is forever and the end is when you turn the software off. Um, so the ultimate uh, scenario, I imagine, is that you're sitting in a lounge chair with a clicker, and if you like something, you click it, and if you don't, you don't click it, right? Mm -hmm. And these just one-bit rewards will tell the musical system at a certain point in time, this sounds good, but what is this? Well, this might be what you're hearing plus what you just heard, because there's a little bit of musical memory required to, to actually define what, what you like and so on and so forth. So, so there's certainly a lot of art involved in what you're rewarding as you're listening to this. So here's the system, and it'll make more sense as you look at it. Um, speakers up. I call this liquid music because let's make sure we got sound. Thank you, Bruce. Now, these are MIDI sounds, and so a MIDI sound has velocity or volume, it has pitch, it has duration, and it has, um, it has a timbre or instrument, what's that called, um, what, the, the channel, the instrument. And so these are random MIDI sounds, and they, they live in this sort of gene pool, right, and they're, they're just sort of floating around, and they come up and they line up and they go through the sound making device or the sound listening device and we're listening to it and that sort of region back there is your musical memory and so if I click that means I liked what I heard and I just gave it a fitness reward now those sounds now have linked up into a phrase because Presumably, I liked what I heard, and so those sounds linked up because they think that I like them to be next to each other. So I'm going to continue to do that. And as you can expect, the early stages of this, it's not sounding very good at all. Um, but gradually, as I reward sounds that I like, or reward sound combinations that I like, they're going to start reproducing and going through the genetic algorithm processes down here in the pool. So you can see already something just came up that had linked together. So these things are starting to link up and the links will become longer and longer over time. Now, if there's a link that comes back and I don't like it because maybe I changed my mind, I'm not going to reward it. So it has a chance to die eventually. So this takes a long time and it's an it's a iterative process. Um, a friend of mine described this as, as really bad sounding music turning into not, not quite as bad sounding music. <laughs> <laughs> it never really becomes, it, it doesn't become Beethoven, Beatles, Chopin or anything. But here are some examples of some pre-evolved things. And um, I'm going to come back and, and really kind of try to design something nice one of these days. But. Um, Here's I was trying to get kind of like a bass line, sort of funky thing. 
these came from you running it for a while? Yeah, this is sort of an, an evolved. And how long, did, how long did you run it for? 10 minutes, 15 minutes, something like that. Now, one thing about this is I could come back to this and start reading this to become a completely different kind of music if I want. I could just sort of push it, push it genetically into a different direction. Um, because there's plenty of random mutation to take advantage of if I wanted to do that. Sounds like jazz fusion. Yeah. <laughs> Is the system aware of like phrasing or for example, if if it if you if you link three notes, would it know to play them in a different key? And that's um, okay. If it heard three notes, would it know to play if them? You, if you say you say you said you like three notes. Yeah. Is it aware of like key change and you know, that it might change the key and play those same, that same phrase in the new key? Um, yes and no. There is there are a series of mu musical mutations, and what they do is they'll take they'll take an organism which is any linked set of sounds, and they'll apply a, a, a mutation to it. And some of those mutations will change the pitch of the whole thing up or down by an arbitrary amount. Other mutations will compress it in time. Other mutations will double each note to create a harmony, and what that harmony is is a mutation. So what I, I tried to do is I intentionally tried to keep musical knowledge away from this, because I actually wanted to. Um, it's as an experiment to see if to see if this stuff can be as dumb as possible as far as music, but mutable and plastic, so that I, the musical mind, can come in and encourage music to come out of it. So it's kind of an experiment. Um, to do that, and that's why it doesn't really sound that that musical. But I, I have a hunch that if this had enough mutations, if it had enough permeability to it, then um, a, 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 a musical person, or actually a non-musical person, can guide it to become very musical. Well, interesting if you could pick up yeah. pieces of Mozart and run it through yeah, like chunks, the, uh, of, chunks of well-formed DNA, musical DNA. <laughs> yeah, like a work like garage band. Seed it. Band, yeah. Seed it. <laughs> yeah. I think he's missing a... Uh, I, I don't know how to use it, but like a beat. I think... <laughs> no, I don't mean that. <laughs> and I don't like the music, but isn't that the fundamental part that the person who's playing or creating the music sets isn't ju isn't just a random collection but they set a certain framework to work in yeah yeah it's missing a beat and i think that the, what, what i want to do is instead of arbitrarily creating a, a metronome i want to try to create um the, the kinds of mutations that create regular right that create re regularity and then that regularity you reward yeah so you should be able to breed amorphous if you see or you should you should be able to get prints, right. you know, depending on how you read it. How are the spaces between the organisms determined? Those are genes. So each each sound has five genes. Timbre, duration, pitch, and time before the next one. Or after the next one. I can't remember which direction. But that but that's a gene. And then uh, an entire organism is, well, actually I call these cells. Each cell has six genes and each organism is composed of cells. And each organism is like a musical phrase. But yeah, that's, that's genetically determined as well. We thought about the changing the reward the mechanism instead of clicking, uh, I like it, I like it. So you put some stuff that you like and make, let it reward the like what would be a different way of rewarding? Yeah, for instance, take a part of Mozart that you like and let yeah. this part reward yeah. mm -hmm. uh, your... Uh, yeah, no, I think that would be interesting to have. I mean, you could have different input inputs, like you could... If something comes through and you could compare it to exactly. a, a certain phrase exactly. each time and give yeah. it a reward. Yeah. Isn't that the way birds, the, the birds learn bird song, right? They, they have a sort of template. Yeah. Once, right? And then they just keep trying. Yeah, yeah. And when, it, when they hit it, then they realize they've recreated a piece of their bird song. Uh huh. They, they Do you all know about isolated the, birds. This is the Konishi and Nikolai. Isolated uh, birds? Well, uh, they studied, Konishi and Nikolai studied isolated mm -hmm. birds to see if they had a mental template of their bird song when they mm -hmm. couldn't hear another mm -hmm. bird. 
right? And so, so as they kept singing, um, when, when it matched their temper, they would say, ah, oh, say that. So they did have a mental temper. They did. They, did. they didn't perfectly recreate that bird song, but they came quite close. Do you all think that a mockingbird was some mutation that happened a long time ago, and then the mockingbird just started imitating everything it heard, and just that just became its way of life? I think mockingbirds are amazing. Maybe when I hear a mockingbird outside, I'm like, God, this is a wonderful creature to be able to do that. What is the advantage to the mockingbird? I don't know, does anybody know? It's probably not mating, right? It's like, as soon as it gets close, it'd be like, you're not. <laughs> creating, creating general confusion you know, yeah. amongst its competitors, maybe. Well, or it could be that. Yeah. Avoid, yeah. avoid being lunch of whatever is mocking. Mm -hmm. So, yeah. what does the mockingbird do? It sings other bird songs. Have you all heard the mockingbird? Yeah. It's amazing. It's a bird that. that if you ever hear a mockingbird, it'll do one bird call, and then it'll do another bird call, and it'll do a completely bird call, and you just sit there for minutes, hours, I don't know how long, and it'll just never repeat itself. A friend that had, uh, friend of mine had a mockingbird who did not possess a, possess a clothes washer or dryer. He used to bring this thing to the laundromat and it would imitate perfectly the sounds of the machines that are finishing up the cycle. <laughs> People are going over to the machine and opening it up, it's still going. You know, this bird is totally confused. <laughs> Could it be a way of showing genetic relatedness? Because we don't have mockingbirds now where we live, but we have lyrebirds. And once, a really long time ago, there was um, a family friend who happened to play the cast nets, and she played them at our house. And years later, they're still playing the cast nets. They've only heard them once. And so they've passed it down through the generations. And so if you had a group that knew that song, meet another group that didn't know that song, well, you know that you're not related. Mm -hmm. Probably, or at least you haven't met each other before. Culture mm -hmm. is culture. You know, um, I heard just about six months ago on NPR, they discovered that it's a variant of the same gene that gives us language. The, the I think it's Fox P2. Fox. They found us that if they, if they knock out that gene in birds, they lose their, mm -hmm. their singing ability. It's the same mm -hmm. gene. Yeah. What, what does this say about the brains of people who are fans of techno? Why that dream? Very simple genetic sequences. There's an author named Peter Todd. Do you all know about him? He's written some work that's in the artificial life sort of bibliography. And he did something about bird songs where, where he simulated, he and another scientist simulated, the, created a model of bird, birds learning songs. Uh, that might be something to look into. I've gone to one tone now. Yeah, I'm just playing pre-evolved stuff because oh. it's more fun. It's more enjoyable to listen to in the background. There's a great series called The Life of Birds, Dave Attenborough. Mm -hmm. He's got a section on the mockingbird who has been photographed so much that it reproduces a perfect clicking sound on the camera. <laughs> 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 it has a blue hyacinth macaw, which is an Amazonian bird that I swear it can it can tear a, door, a doorknob, it can bend a doorknob off the door. So the beak is so mm. powerful. Um, when they listen to porn videos, <laughs> you will find as you're walking toward, and this, the, these macaws sleep by hanging upside down. So just before they're going to sleep, they're doing all kinds of regurgitation of the day's noise, and like when we dream. They regurgitate the sounds they heard during the day, and you can hear the, <laughs> the porn videos. And I crept down the hallway as I heard the sound, and I managed to get my eye just around the corner. And they're so sharp, they'll stop immediately. <laughs> and, and Bob was saying, yeah, one day somebody's going to try to burglarize his house, and he's gonna, they're going to come in and they're going to hear this cacophony of sounds and music and porn, and <laughs> then they're going to run screaming out of the house. <laughs> This bird. It also uses roller skates. There's roller skates for these things. They they step into them and they roller skate. Yes. <laughs> so I mean, birds are so amazingly intelligent, and they have this mimetic sort of trait. I wonder if the mammals hadn't taken over, whether the dinosaurs or then the birds would have become the intelligent Probably, ones yeah. here. They walk on two legs. Raccoons. They don't. They don't have fossil horns. 
They don't have what? Opposable thumbs. Yeah, but who are we to say that opposable thumbs are necessary to evolve into us? I mean, you know, they have they have other they, they may have they have flight. They have beaks. Yeah, they do so. have opposable thumbs. They're feet though. They have the reverse thumb on their foot. So yeah, they can't grab stuff. So like that. I used to wonder what wait for me when I came home. And and one time he walked right up to me and held out his hand. Oh yes, beat him. It was it's weird. Good. And I guess so it doesn't work the same way, but it looks the same way, huh? A little bit thumb. Mm-hmm. They got two, well, it kind of depends on what card it is, but usually there's two that go up and then two that goes down and then sometimes another little little guy in the back. I think it's the fast fast food analogy of of switching places in evolution. For 300 million years, dinosaurs used us, little tiny mammals scurrying around as instant fast food. It's our turn. (laughs) But their turn, well, actually, it'll probably be arthropods next. (laughs) It will be the fast food for the arthropods. <laughs> arthropods. Hmm? arthropods. Arthropods. Insects. They have their time yeah. coming. Is it open source? Hmm? Is it open source? The code isn't, but I I'm, I might open it at some point. I'll we'll clean it up a bit. Java. Java. It's Java. Yeah. Have you ever thought about biofeedback devices? Is that input? Uh, I don't know if I've thought about it, but do you have a way to do that? You got some um, machinery? I, I know someone who worked on okay. such a thing, and I, I don't cool. know the status is. But. Yeah. I think I'd want to have this to be a richer environment before we, we get in, before trying new input devices. Um, I think it could be a lot richer than it is. Do we need a little preview of the other half of your presentation? Sure. If, yes. If you want, if we, if you want to switch gears to that, sure. I shouldn't close that. Um, okay, uh, real, real quick. Um, so this is some, something I presented at Artificial Life uh, uh, Ten in Indiana, uh, where L- Larry Yeager is and Douglas Hofstadter, and um, this is a combination of two techniques that most of us are familiar with. One is cellular autom- automata and the other is particle swarm optimization. Particle swarms are things that move fluidly and they have inertia and and physics and so on. And cellular automata are things that are very discrete and march through time and space. And so I wanted to combine those two. One is very fluid and one is very discrete. And so if you imagine this table having a bunch of square tiles, and if you imagine taking a marble and rolling it across, it, it crosses certain tiles. These tiles are the cells of the cellular automaton. And the marble has a neighborhood around it of cells that it uses to determine its, its uh, force. So, so I'm the marble and I'm rolling along these tiles and some tiles are changing color constantly, right? And initially each tile has its own CA rules and they're all random at first, which is why it looked random when I started this. But as the marbles roll along, the marbles are the, are the particles in the particles one. And there's, I don't know, a couple hundred of them. You can barely see in the little white dots. And the marbles, instead of in a normal particle swarm where they're sort of seeking the right optimal whatever, these are just sort of passively being pushed around by the dynamics of the CA. And so they'll get pulled, pushed and pulled by, by these cells changing colors. And what happens is if a marble finds itself being moved around chaotically, it's not a happy marble. But if it moves in a straight line, it's happy. And so it rewards the cells below it with, with uh, genetic algorithm happiness. And so then what happens is it encourages the rules that enable it to have a straight line path. And what happens is gliders emerge as a result. Because gliders are coherent, coherent space-time patterns. And uh, so if there's a glider or a proto-glider, or anything that, that has any kind of coherent motion, no matter how brief, it'll give that marble, I'm going to continue with the marble metaphor, it'll give that marble an opportunity to have a momentarily good ride. And eventually, uh, this we don't have time to, to see it evolve, but eventually this will turn into a big glider-rich CA. And they're, and they're usually always very different. Um, 
and you can kind of see a little bit of coherent motion starting. Certain sort of pools of coherency will, will appear. Um, what was that? Was that a glider wash? Oh yeah, the wash. Yeah, I'll explain that. Basically, what, what, what I'm doing there is every once in a while I'll just sort of like sweep down with, with uh, random um, cells uh, of a non-zero, mm -hmm. non-zero, non-quiescent cells to just kind of stir the soup. Mm -hmm. And after the, after the uh, CA becomes a homogeneous CA, I don't need to do the sweep anymore because now the gliders are self-sustaining. So at a certain point, um, you can see this graph here. It's just, it's only begun, but usually right around the middle here is when, um, is when it, it reaches a, a level of, of, uh, uh, of, of coherency. And I have two, two lines. One is genetic convergence and the other is average ride quality. Ride quality is how good the ride is for the average particle. And that goes up over time. And genetic convergence goes up as well as all of the cells become similar in, in genetics. So that's that. It's called Gliders and Riders. Mm -hmm. And uh, it's free. You can look at it on, on the internet. Um, I want to add a feature where you can look at pre-evolved uh, um, scenarios. There's, there's a little region of gliders. Can you see these things kind of mm -hmm. moving around? Moving. I just love watching them, kind of these little creatures oh, yeah. emerging. Mm -hmm. So there's multiple rules going on at the same time. Does it eventually kind of end up with a single rule? Exactly, exactly. right. That's what enables, that's what, I mean, the, the fact that a, a single glider exists over this span of space and time means that there's coherency in the rules in that region. And sometimes you'll have competing regions where certain kinds of gliders are growing up here and other ones are growing there and the dominant mm -hmm. one takes over. So do you end up with a field with, that doesn't look like that anymore and there's just gliders flying all over the place and persisting? Uh -huh. Do you, like, can you show that or do you just have to wait for it to um, happen? <laughs> you, you, yeah, it takes, it takes uh, 10 minutes or so. Yeah. I want to make a 3D version of this. <laughs> and I want to make it so that you can sort of in slow motion be, take a, 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 gli a, a, a particle's eye view of, of what you're riding and you can sort of like ride along this throbbing sort of glider. That's what I want to do. Uh, the washing stuff that you are doing is to get out of local minima? The reason for that is to um, let me see if I can explain. Uh, it's um, at the very beginning. There are no so quiescence is the absence of color. It's the it's the zero uh, quantity of a cell in a CA, and any any uh, any non quiescent cell which would have a value of one, two, three, four, however many uh, states there are in the cell. Um, it starts out quiescent, and that first sweep starts the soup boiling. And if there's a, 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 a if there's a space where there's nothing moving, the sweep uh, helps. Helps. If, if you want, it would not do that. It would be it would get into stagnation and will stay in lower quality. I would say it's it's more of a statistical thing. If I just yeah. did one sweep at the beginning and never again. Yeah. Um, something would emerge, but it might it might die off, or it might take a long time. Mm -hmm. But what is the difference? Is a pure CA system would produce gliders. So you don't have to have the swarm. Um, the particle swarm? Yeah, you don't have to have the particle swarm to get gliders. No, I mean you can make gliders by designing the rules. You can design the rules like in the game of life. So when when you know this number of cells is on and so on and so forth. That's designing gliders. This is evolving gliders. So the particle swarm. The particle swarm applies an evolutionary fitness function to the CA and makes the gliders emerge. So, are the are the rules for the CA um, different in different elements? I mean, do the rules for the CA themselves kind of evolve over time? 
Um, I have, I have a, a rule template that's got lots of variables in it, and the variables are the genes. Mm -hmm. It's explained in the paper. Okay. There's a paper you can read by just going, going on to there. Gliders and writers. It's all in there. Wow. Well, okay. Okay. That's okay. wonderful. Thank you. Next. So, uh, my, name, my name is Sharon Minsak, and um, I, I heard about this meeting because I saw the announcement and it said, item four, bring stuff if you have it, and I guess they wanted all of us to, but I happened to email somebody back about that announcement and they replied and encouraged me, be sure you follow item number four. So, <laughs> hence I brought something. Um, and I'm going to try to do it fast. I haven't talked about this in a while, actually, and I didn't prepare it specifically for this. And don't be intimidated by this PowerPoint, which was put together a few years ago for a talk that was an hour long. I will not take an hour. Um, um, so I, I am a biologist. Um, I, I study the evolution of development. Um, so I, you know, have done mainly worked with embryos. Um, and I'm very interested in the evolution of embryos and um, but I have some programming background before and um, I always was interested in combining the two and doing simulations in biology I dabbled in that earlier um, and I um, I uh, how to go fast um, don't go too fast. Don't go too fast. Yeah. Um, I <laughs> okay. Let me just um, walk through this and remind me of things to say. So, so that's me, and that's where I did this project in Austria at the Conrad Lorenz Institute, um, where they were looking for people who wanted to do uh, theoretical studies in evolutionary developmental biology, or what we call affectionately evo devo. Um, <laughs> so I had been doing all the embryo stuff and wanted, had this idea for a project and so they funded me and I went over there and they did it. Um, so in the big talk I, I gave some introduction as to the biology I did and how I was taking the two, uh, I've done the two approaches. Maybe. It's a nice little uh, starfish um, juvenile, that thing's actually about a millimeter in diameter which I, I grew up in a dish from, from fertilized egg. So I worked with starfish and sea urchins and before that frogs. And whereas this is this is the new project, the, the computer project. So um, I am interested in the evolution of phenotypic novelty. Phenotype is your your characteristics. Uh, all this stuff that uh, that he didn't talk about <laughs> because he's talking about the genes, but the genes are interesting because of what they make. And so I'm interested in what they make. And I, these sea urchins I studied, and some typical sea urchin larvae, and some very atypical sea urchin larvae, which develop in a different way. And um, that was the kind of work that I did before. Um, and, okay, this is just more of the same, I'll get into that. But the evolution of body plans is a big topic in, in Evo Devo. Um, the body plan is sort of the overall. Um, structure of an organism. We, we, the typical body plan for us is being bilaterally symmetrical, having two arms and two legs, having a, having a, a spinal cord, for example. So the major features in different organisms have different ones, and the kinoderms, which includes that starfish there, and the sea urchins are very interesting because they're not bilaterally symmetrical. They're, they're really symmetrical. And the big issue is how, how did that evolve? They actually evolved from bilaterally symmetrical organisms. And in fact, if I go back, for those larvae, their larvae, which is what a young one of these looks like, is bilaterally symmetrical, but it develops into something <laughs> radially symmetrical. Ooh, so, that. yeah, big topic. So, <laughs> um, so I, you know, through the years working on this, I was thinking I really want to get the computer modeling back to working on this. And how would you, how would you simulate the evolution of, of something like this? Um, and you know, I tried to imagine like simulating a starfish. Well, that's really hard, as you were talking about. Um, or even something much simpler than a starfish. Um, how would you simu simulate a whole organism? There have been um, simulations done in biology which are kind of different from the A-life simulations you're used to, but more 
theoretical biology approach where you're simulating a lot of things about cell behavior, um, a lot of physics and mechanics of how cells interact. Um, but they're, they're always very specific about a particular cell type of a particular uh, tissue. You never get it's too, <clears throat> too much computation to try to simulate a whole organism. Um, and I had the idea that it would be better uh, to try to simulate something extremely simple and to actually evolve it from single-celled organisms. Now that sounds so cool that I better, I better give the disclaimer that I haven't actually done that. Um, but I, I wanted to get a start at what kind of model cells would you need in order to do something like that. Um, so changes, let's see here, so evolution of body plan is just an example. Um, there's the arthropods, by the way, I mentioned earlier. <laughs> Not just insects, Not just also insects. crustaceans. Um, so there's, the, there, there's the kind of body plan that I, that I worked on. That's the internal skeleton of a uh, sea urchin. You've probably seen some of those. Um, so, all right, let's just go ahead. Okay, so, um, what can we do in silico? So it's Evo Devo. And my idea was if I could manage to simulate an, an, an organism that has somehow a life cycle and some kind of development, and then subject it to the typical artificial life approach that you're used to, construct a population of these individuals in a simulated environment, and subject them to mutation and selection, and, and use this to explore evolution, that, that's kind of my goal. Um, so I'm actually only working on step one, and um, and so even though my my goal is to do Evo Devo in the computer, this at the moment has no Evo in it and no Devo in it, um, because I'm starting small. Um, so how do you simulate individual organisms? Well, the the, the real important thing is the cells, um, and that's something that's often left out of a lot of the artificial life work that I've seen. Um, because cells are complicated and, and, and messy. Um, and sometimes this is somebody else's work. So a lot of you are probably familiar with it. This was a nice little simulation of, um, of, of getting complexity out of, of cells, um, simulated cells, but they were modeled as perfect circles. And you see a lot of this kind of thing. And perfectly circular cells aren't going to produce anything that's mean, biologically meaningful. Um, because cells are not perfectly circular and they're also not um, perfectly uniform and they have, they have um, uh, specialized parts that interact and, and um, those things are very important in the development of, of an embryo into an organism. This is from a project I did quite some time back that I alluded to earlier. Um, um, when I first started graduate school, I actually, with the intent of, of doing simulations, like I got to do some, and this um, this is just to show um, the kind of uh, um, theoretical biology approach that has been used. Where um, so each of these is a run, a different run, using different parameters over time. And when I joined the project, someone had generated this, and I experimented with what rules the cells would be following. Um, to try to get them to behave more like what was supposed to be happening. This is supposed to be the development of, in a frog embryo, something called the notochord, if you know what that is. It's basically it's a tissue that arises early in the embryo, and one of the things this does is it gets longer and narrower because of cell rearrangement. And we're trying to duplicate that. Tubes. And, and, it, and it wasn't, it doesn't make a tube, but anyway, it, it, does, it, it makes a cylinder though. Um, this, this is what they had, and they didn't, didn't look anything like it, and by manipulating the rules that the cells follow, that doesn't look anything like it either, but this does look quite a lot like it. Um, so that was successful. And this is just showing a blow up of an individual cell, and that we were actually using uh, a model of the forces going on um, as these cells interact with each other, where one, the arrow is pointing outwards are, um, are um, hydrostatic pressure and these arrows around the outside are tension in the membrane in the outside of the cell. So it's that kind of, that kind of physics. So um, that kind of, but uh, that's a great thing. But as I said, that kind of thing would be really hard to scale up into, um, 
into an evolving whole organism. We can barely do a notochord, let alone a whole frog embryo. Um, <clears throat> and so I was looking for a way, uh, a simpler system where I could get some of that flavor, but combine it with the artificial life approach and get something that's evolvable. And right now, you talked earlier in the first, uh, you talked a lot about vision, having vision. So I've got a, a, a vision for that that could happen. Um, I looked at a lot of different models that are used in theoretical biology for actual cell interactions, and I came up with this one, which I took a gamble would be the best starting point for me. And actually, before I, what should I say about that? Um, the rest of what I have is pretty, it's, it's, it's down dealing with mechanics of cell interaction and cell movement. Um, it's almost more fun to think about what I'm going to do with it when, it's, when it works. And I'm just trying to lay the ground, groundwork for the basic physics and be able to start to, um, you know, add genomes and mutations and, and that kind of thing. Um, and I'm also not a physicist, this was actually the hard, hard for me, but um, I wanted to, this is, this is the fundamental groundwork. So um, this model that I picked is, uh, somebody else developed this model, so I'm going to show you basically how it works, and if I have time, maybe show you some of the things I did to improve it to make it more towards what I'm looking for. Um, it, it is based on a, a cellular automaton-like system. So, and in this case I'm using a hexagonal array, but it's basically a um, bunch of uh, elements. Um, it's not exactly a cellular automaton because there are some pieces of information which are not stored in the array. So there's excess. Um, so, but basically it's a simple array. Um, every element has a, an index, a number in it, and a cell is simply defined as uh, a bunch of adjacent uh, elements that all have the same numeral in them. So all those ones, that's cell number one, all those twos are cell number two, they have a certain kind of behavior, zero, cell zero is the environment which has slightly different rules than, than the other ones, and we can do this in color coding instead and make it easier to look at. So um, basically this was, this was put together by a physicist, and the idea uh, it actually came from a model that had been used for other things in physics, but he made it better for doing biological cells. Um, and the main thing is to work with um, the adhesion between cells, because cells are sticky, and that creates mechanical forces, and um, also just the basic uh, mechanical structure. So this is kind of how it goes repeated uh, evolution, not, not in the grand sense, but evolution of this, um, of the, of this world, of this model. Yeah. Um, so your, your basic simulation goes like this. Um, you're, you select a point, and so you know, a point and its neighbor at random from somewhere in the field, a little black arrow there, um, and it's an arrow because once you've selected those two neighboring points, you can copy one into the other. So step three <laughs> is, is to do that copy, and so the red got copied into the white, and then uh, the cells change, change shape. Um, oops, that's another thing. <clears throat> um, so what's step two? Um, you, could, you could randomly pick points and change the shape of these cells and it wouldn't be very meaningful. Step two, oh, I just showed you another one up here, another example. Step two is to, after you've come up with these random points, to accept them or reject them based on energy minimization criterion. So now this is where the physics comes in and the idea is certain things are likely to happen and certain things are not likely to happen and it depends on the, um, the energy involved in the, in, the, in the changes. So how is that defined? And I'm not going to take through all the details of the math, but the energy has three components. 
adhesion volume and surface area. So the idea behind adhesion is that sticky things stick to each other, <laughs> and that pulling them apart from each other is hard. So something that sticky things happen to come into contact with each other, they stay stuck. So that, that's a, a favorable um, configuration, is for sticky things to stay stuck. Um, and the volume and surface area is, is the basic mechanical properties of the, of the cell. So for one thing, um, the cell over a short period of time is, is going to have constant volume because it's, um, it's, uh, it's basically water. The water is incompressible. It's also going to have constant surface area um, because it's, the surface area is made of membrane and it's finite, amount, finite amounts of that and it's also under tension. So you can't just stretch it <coughs> in amounts. So these are the constraints. I'm okay, thanks. Those are the constraints on the cells. And each time you do one of these moves, you can calculate based on having a certain amount of adhesion, what's the change of energy, and the, um, you've changed um, the volume and surface area. And so we're going to also create a, basically a force that maintains the volume and surface area. It basically gives it a, a, a springiness or a, um, a resistance to being stretched or compressed. And um, then these little lambdas in here are just uh, you could weight which ones of these are more important. So if these are more important, then, then they become um, very stiff and resistant to the stretch and compression. So um, not much elasticity. And if, whereas if you lower these values, then, then they, the cells become more elastic. And this is, we won't go through that. Um, this is something that's added to this. We can talk and talk. Some, somebody talked about standing pot. Um, you, <laughs> um, this is this is how I started the pot. Um, the, the the obvious thing is if something's unfavor if something's favorable, you do it, and if something's unfavorable, you reject it because only favorable things happen. But the idea here is that um, things are happening somewhat randomly, and there's you could think of it as thermal energy um, making some things giving a boost to energy here, and other things are lower energy. Um, there's an algorithm called the Metropolis algorithm, which you can use to let things that are only a little bit unfavorable happen with some probability. So if this is a graph of the probability of occurring for different delta H, you'd start the simple way. Is, is, it's 1 over here and 0 over there. But instead, we have a trail off so that things that are only a little bit unfavorable have some probability of happening. And so that prevents, if you didn't have that, the thing would get into its local minimum of, of low energy and then it would stop. And it would be boring. So, okay, so this is the, this is the simulation. This is actually a quick time movie of the simulation. Maybe I will show you first an actual piece of, well, let's start with something simple. Um, and as you see, I, I, um, I have those cells have membranes, but that was a later addition. So let me show you the um, the one, the, basically my implementation of what I found in the literature um, with only minor modification. So there's a few cells, and um, that's fine. And basically, as you do this this iteration over and over, they just start wiggling around. The, the hexagons here are kind of small to see. And you can see they have kind of jagged edges because of those small hexagons. And each one of those is a cell started as a rectangle just because it's easy, but once you start it going, they have amorphous shapes, which is another thing that's hard to do. That's one of the reasons I liked this model, because it made it easy to do amorphous shapes. And then you notice that two of them have just touched each other, and they're sticky, and they're going to stay stuck together from now on. They touched each other only because the random movements happened to bring them in close enough to each other, once they're like that, they're like that. And if you let this run long enough, then um, eventually this one will come into contact with those. I mean, maybe sometimes it won't, maybe it'll drift off. But if it does, once it does, the ultimate uh, um, low energy, lowest energy configuration is that they'll be arranged as a triangle with each cell touching each of the other two, and they'll, and they'll never leave that. Once they once they get into it, um, so this was basically you know let me try different 
built in they, in order to sort out and create a more interesting non-random structure. They don't have to do something deliberate. If the cells are of differential stickiness and just the random motion around that gets, the, the, that gets them to, to sort of reassociate with each other and sample their environment will cause all the, the stickiest ones to be stuck together in the middle and engulfed by the less sticky ones. Mm -hmm. And so this model, um, I'll, I'll basically show it running. Um, it takes about an hour or so to just run it um, and get something useful out of it. So this is this is the program. I'll go back to the I'll go back to the uh, PowerPoint now because you'll get to see the QuickTime movies, which are um, run much faster. <laughs> so um, that's the that's that one again. Same idea. Here's that one, and pretty quickly, the green is in the middle and the blue gets to the outside. And so, uh, so that's the basic POTS model and the, and the basic basic biological function that it performs, which is which is pretty good. So um, then we got to there were let's see this is the part I probably should keep. I should probably keep short. I think I've given you a flavor. But this is, this is actually what I started with. It was kind of fun to, OK, I read about the thing, and I talked to the guy who implemented it, and I devised it, and I you know, made my own implementations, and so on. The next was to try to make it into something, into something useful that um, would work better, ultimately, um, be more real, realistic. Because this, uh, this has some problems that make it not totally general. And what I'm really looking for is so that I'm not stuck with a simulation like that notochord simulation that I showed you, um, where all I can simulate is notochords. I want something that's really general, that where cells can behave in all kinds of different environments that make sense for cells to be in. And this was designed for um, basically studying cells in culture on a dish um, and interactions, kind of like that, that um, differential adhesion kind of. Uh, circumstance. And I'm, I'm thinking about embryos, and I'm thinking one of the things that cells um, need to do in embryos um, is that they're not just uniformly sticky. And if they were, it wouldn't get much more interesting than, um, than that sorting out. What they have is is um, localized patches of stickiness that are controlled and regulated by all the kind of gene networks that we were talking about earlier. And it's not really fully understood how, how cells crawl and so on. Um, but to have an interesting simulation, you need to have, it needs to be, the cells need to be able to regulate their stickiness. You can put some sticky proteins out there on the surface or take them back in um, or have different parts of the cell that have different properties. And so what I want to do, ultimately, is have, first of all, membranes, because all this happens on a membrane. And, and membranes are important for a lot of other reasons. And you saw that I, I have some cells that have membranes. Um, but then still, the membrane shouldn't be uniformly sticky. I, I should be able to have um, adhesive elements on that, that membrane that can be um, deployed in different ways by the cell. So first step, <coughs> first obvious step, how about cells that aren't sticky at all, onto which that will be the background for having adhesive elements. And so finally you'll have a cell where, where patches are sticky and in between not. Because basically membrane itself is not sticky. It's the protein, protein floating around in the membranes that are sticky. So I just made some uh, adhesion equals zero cells just to see what would happen. And so that's why they're gray. Um, and um, this is still the original model without my having done anything to it, and what, you, what would you expect? Well, they will, they will not stay stuck to each yeah, other. They shouldn't. Not sticky, so they, just they should just disperse. disperse. Yeah. Exactly. Exactly what I expected. And I didn't expect to have any, any work to do about this, but they didn't disperse. <laughs> and it turns out there's an artifact 
At first, I thought it was a bug in my program. I must be doing something wrong. <laughs> um, but it turned out not to be. Bouncing off each other? They're what? Bouncing off each other? Bouncing? They're, I'm not sure what you mean by bouncing. But they're, they're staying stuck to each other, basically. It's because they're minimizing surface area? Um, no, it turns out it's because of the basic nature of that POTS move that I showed you, that underlying copy. If you think about it, um, and I probably should, I should cut this short, but if you think about it, when you do this copy, it changed the location of the membrane on both cells. And so um, it's a coupled movement. Both cells are moving together. And so the only time they could come apart is if you happen to do a POTS move where the environment cell, which can also be involved, is copied in there. You can kind of peel it apart. But a lot of the moves are both cells, membranes moving together, and they're coupled. And so it naturally creates this okay, resonance. This, this part. It's a resonance. Resonance? Like you could say mm -hmm. that. I call it suction. Okay. <laughs> um, inappropriate suction, not caused by your physical forces. So, um, but you would need energy to separate, right? It or shouldn't, it shouldn't be that if they're not if they're not sticky. Right. So um, basically, I, I came up with an algorithm that said, well, the other thing that you could happen if the red cell were pulling away from the blue cell. Yeah, but the, uh, I would expect if it's like random work, it should be separate. Exactly. Exactly. So it's random work. Well, but it's not random in that the behavior of one cell is not random. With, re with respect to the behavior of the other cell. Okay. So right? there, there's that's the problem. There's no relation between them. The, 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 no. There's too the, much the, the, the blue doesn't know about the red, and the red doesn't know about the blue. It shouldn't. Right. So it can overlap. Right. So, so what I did to, to solve that was say, well, if the red is pulling away from the blue, they might move together if they're stuck together, or they might move together if the, the blue cell is under compression and naturally wants to expand to fill into the space, it's another way they can move together. But if those things don't happen, then it should be able to just pull away and fluid fill in. So I say, let's say there's some of this fluid environment nearby, and an alternative move would be for it to be copied over that instead, like so. So then I evaluate two moves, and I evaluate the delta H, the energy change for both those moves, and I say, which one's more favorable, and take that move. And just doing that little change has changed everything. So then we have it behaving exactly like we'd expect. Is this indicative of the search for water and the way water gives you that extra property to support life? Like we're talking about, we need carbon. We're always searching for water, saying how does water impact what cells are doing and why is it so important? And does it... I want to... I want to say no. I'll <laughs> be a, a wet blanket, so to speak, and say no. no. Um, because because really that was that was just an artifact of the model. Mm -hmm. It was not really reflecting anything physical. Mm -hmm. This is just um, water's not doing anything special. So did you do the equivalent of making an energy neutral interaction rather than a, an interaction which no, that's well, that's what I hope to have done by making them non-sticky. Mm -hmm. The only three forces in here are the non-stickiness, or the stickiness rather, the the compressibility or incompressibility of the cells, and the stretchability or, or instretchability of the membranes. Those are the only forces. Mm -hmm. oh, there are more things that need to be added. That's all that's in there. So, is is there an equal probability uh, for the move to move onto a an occupied cell like a um, part of a, another cell versus moving into empty space? Equal probability. A point is selected at random, which could easily be a point outside a cell, and then mm -hmm. one of its neighbors is selected at random. Okay. And it, have you tried um, giving it a higher probability to move into empty space versus... No. So I wonder if that might... We're thinking about We're thinking about now What's the state of this research now? Where are you... Well, the state of this research... So actually, I worked on this a couple of years ago, and I've gotten a little bit sidetracked. Thank you for the lead into the plug. <laughs> I got a little bit sidetracked. Um, I've been doing some teaching, like heavy duty, adjunct, full time, but paid like part time teaching um, at the local college over in, in Moraga, if you know St. Mary's College. 
And um, I, I don't want to do that anymore. I want to get back to the research. And so, um, you know, as an adjunct, I've always, uh, I'm always looking for a job anyway. And now I'm broadening, broadening that out to look at non-academic opportunities, possibly. Um, I, I want to find out what's out there. Um, academic would be good, too, but my research is so oddball, I haven't found a home. Um, so actually, I would really love to talk with any or all of you who are interested in this stuff, or one-on-one, -on -one, just talk about what you do and the world you do it in and what, where the opportunities might be. Um, so, um, yeah, that's the state of it. It's you're hasn't based done here, it. then? Based I'm based here, yeah. I mean, basically, the, the job in Austria where I did this was the perfect job, except for one thing. It had an absolute two-year limit, and after that, it couldn't be renewed. Mm -hmm. So I came back here, and, I, and that was a postdoc. So I've been looking for a faculty job, and, and it hasn't worked out that well. well. The AI yeah, but I'm here. community, I mean, there are places where people who are doing artificial life of various sorts have faculty positions, right? The places that are sympathetic to that. I guess there are, and part of my problem might be not knowing where to look, because I know where to look for biology jobs, and I don't think they're mostly in biology departments. But I've looked at computer science, too. I've seen a few that work. We should talk about this one-on-one, -on -one. Mm -hmm. not, not, not do this as on the internet. <laughs> <laughs> but anyway, there were, there were a bunch of other stuff in there. What next, Bruce? Um, I guess we, are there any other news items or requests or, at the homebrew club people would stand up and Lee Felsenstein would give them five seconds to say, yeah, I need a job or I have, a, I have an extra pro microprocessor or anybody like it or whatever. So is there any uh, people who have a five second uh, sound bite about anything to do with artificial life or your research or or you all sound bite it out. Um, the second question is, uh, do you want to do a meeting sometime over the summer when it makes sense for people's travel schedules? And I know, Jeffrey, you're leaving on um, the end of August for several months. Should we just commune on the list and figure it out? Yeah, we're so, right. Does this group have a permanent home? As in, is the would we say that we want to move, it. move, move around? Uh, move around. I, I'm, I'm ready to have the pieces. That's all right. If you want, and no problem with that. It helps us scoop up different kinds of people, but then others have to keep, take Caltrain, train, and get rides in this day of expensive gasoline. <laughs> <laughs> cool. But this was a wonderful meeting, and thanks again to Alan. We'll have a great record of it, and I'm sure that we'll get a ton of viewers <laughs> on Vimeo. Yeah, thanks for staying on one later for, to get everyone fit in. Yeah. Thank, thank you, Jeffrey, and the Internet Archive for yeah. letting us use the building. Sure, yeah. they, were, they were amazing. I said, can I bring a whole bunch of people that nobody you know, has never been here before that, well, probably that I just bring a bunch of strangers in here. It's like, yeah, bring them all in. <laughs> oh, Bruce Bruce was like Bruce. totally cool about it. Bruce said that. No, uh, Jacques. Said Jacques said that. Bruce's okay. assistant. That was cool. Jacques, the, you know, the guy who pulls the strings and ropes. And if stuff. you want to know about emergence, uh, it, there's a little thing out there that says first maps of the internet, and it talks about the first ARPANET and yeah. nodes. It's kind of it's real early in the late 60s. There's, is there any evidence to show that the net is evolving at all, like a biological? Organism. I think there's lots of evidence, yeah. Yeah. Well, Tom Barbalay's theory is the singularities already happened and that we're being gobbled. Our, our, our mental frameworks are attached to this thing that's consuming them all. It's called the net or media or whatever. And we're in it. I think it's the brain and where are the neurons. Was yeah. well, there a body too? You know, as reading this book recently, I think it's called The, the Muse and the Machine. Yeah. And it, yeah, has anyone? It, he, he talks about sort of. I'm just early on in the book, and he's talking about how ancient people thought, and he kind of posits that maybe ancient people thought differently than we think now. Mm -hmm. And it just occurred to me that we live in, in such this digital world where 
like even our appliances, we, we push a button and so we expect a certain thing to happen, and it does. But I think, you know, ancient peoples lived in a more analog world where they, they didn't, things weren't so necessarily discreet and predictable. And so I, it does make me wonder, like, if our, if our creations are reshaping our brains. You see that very haunting, a very haunting picture on the net last month of the aircraft flew over that un, undiscovered tribe in the Amazon. And the guys, basically, the, the first time they saw the plane, they sent the, most of the women and children away to a hiding spot. And the next, when the plane came back, they were all painted in ochre, aiming the bows at the aircraft. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I think there's only a few dozen, maybe, I thought there were none, but there's a few dozen un, uncontacted tribes. And we have this last little fl mm. flicker of, of, of humanity living in the state it did for millions of years. And, and they're talking about making it like a national park and restricting access to the area so these people mm, can yeah. continue to live. Mm. But uh, they had not seen an airplane before. But what if those people don't want to live that way? What if they want to live yeah, that that's way? Yeah, that's just thinking. It's like we're boxing them in. That's the dilemma. I mean, that's a good dilemma. What about parallels with an embryonic nervous system? Is that, uh, is that <laughs> what do you mean? I mean the way that the way the net is evolving. Um, I mean, it, it divides at a certain rate of speed in, in biology. Uh, differentiation begins afterwards at sixty-four divisions initially, and then it uh, something like that. And, and, and then, uh, and then it, there's a really fast period of uh, evolution, and then there's a birthing process, and then there's a whole different phase of evolution. Mm -hmm. You know, and and you know, since biological organisms are feeding it and creating it, is it reflecting that kind of evolution at all, or is it something entirely different? Well, one of the things, an example around yeah. here is the redwood forest, because yeah. redwood forest, they started out competing with tree tree ferns cycads and things like mm -hmm. that. Then the redwoods dom went all, all over the continents. I mean, they were really dominant. And they created the, this mycelial layer that carries nutrients between redwood groves for miles. I mean, there's this incredible network that pushes nutrients around. And the trees are rhizomes up, you know, hundreds in some cases arising off the same, the same root system. And so re redwoods went from, you know, single things to massively bound networks. But what happened was over time it became what was known as a crown forest where very few things can live in it except redwoods. So it was completely dominated and used all of its resources com completely and very few, th very little cracks for anything else. And, and then it became ossified and rigid and very energy intensive to maintain that, that network. And then when the, the planet start to dry out and, and cool down you had glaciation and Glaciation and desertification were the death knell for the redwoods. And now there's only a thin strip of them in California and some in China, and that's it. But they are one of the, the plant kingdom's great examples of when you heavily network something and you, it consumes all resources and it gets massive, but then it gets incredibly uh, vulnerable. Mm -hmm. So you think the internet's reflecting it? Like we're like now. Yeah. Mm -hmm. We're going to consume all that oil and create the most aw awesome airports, highways, whatever, and become incredibly vulnerable. <laughs> Sometimes the redwood forest seems like an organism to me. Like we were going through Mirror Woods recently, and we were looking at how the redwoods, you know, send up roots, and it's basically one organism that's sending off its circle of children and everything. And it kind of acts like an organism, doesn't it? Yeah. Mm -hmm. The duff that they put down. I mean with the fires that are going on in the Santa Cruz Mountains where we live, I, several years ago I cleared out like three feet of duff, which is the material falling from redwoods, mm -hmm. and threw it onto a hot burn pile that had been 30 feet tall before that with coals. I tell you, that duff just put that hot coal fire out, <laughs> suffocated mm -hmm. it. So redwoods even have conquered fire. Mm -hmm. you know, and when, when a fire does get in the redwood forest, the bark is, is fire re resistant or retardant, so they'll burn up a ways and it'll stop. And they use fire to cauterize themselves when they become these hollow tubes and there's insects in them. The fires burn the outside, inside out, to kill the insects and allows the mother tree to live another thousand years. So they, they not only have conquered fire, they use it where they, they can. So, but they're going away.